Welcome to everybody. Uh, I do apologize for my croaky throat, but I've got a very bad cold. Um, but I hope I'll be able to keep going <coughs> for the next uh, 60 minutes or so. I noticed in the chat box, a couple of people are asking how long is the session? Um, probably about 45 uh, minutes from me. And then um, as Georgia said, there'll be an opportunity uh, for you to um, have your uh, questions uh, responded to. So uh, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about uh, communicative writing, not just writing, but communicative writing um, in the classroom, but not just in any classroom, uh, in the IGCSE English as a Second Language, and even more than that, in the differentiated IGCSE English as a, a Second Language. Um, hopefully all of that will become clear um, during the next 60 minutes or so. So I think most of you uh, who are joining us today know who I am. My name is Peter Lucantone, that's Italian. My dad was Italian, my mum is English. I was born in the UK and educated there. And literally all of my uh, working life, I've been in, in, um, uh, in, in education, in the ELT profession, uh, obviously starting off as a teacher then moving into teacher training. I've been a manager, uh, I've had my own language school. Uh, and now I work for Cambridge University Press and Assessment as the professional learning and development manager um, across the whole of the uh, MENA region. Um, and I'm very lucky, uh, very proud to say that I'm also an author. Um, and I have several uh, titles with Cambridge University Press, Introduction to English as a Second Language, uh, Cambridge IGCSE, English as a Second Language. And the sixth edition will be uh, published uh, very soon and a new handbook for teachers, which I've uh, co-written with a, a good friend and colleague of mine, Matt uh, Elman, called From Teacher to Trainer. Um, that's the cover of the, uh, of the new book there over on the right. Uh, lovely, lovely green, uh, lovely motif at the bottom. Um, what we're gonna do today then is, is cover three main things and hopefully be able to draw some conclusions as well. <coughs> the first thing is we're gonna have a think about uh, communicative writing uh, essentials. In other words, what, what underpins communicative writing? What do we need to be looking for? Uh, what should be evident um, when we're tasking students to write in a communicative way? Then we're going to have a look at um, six principles of uh, differentiated learning, and we're going to talk about how those principles uh, fit into the, our teaching practice uh, in, in the classroom. And as I say, I think we'll be able to draw um, some quite strong conclusions uh, at the end as well. But just before we go into the main part of what I want to talk about, I'd like to do a little uh, warm up activity, if you like. Um, I think for many of you, it's probably coming to the end of your working day. I know some of you are uh, probably starting your day, but I think for most people, it's coming towards the end of the day. Um, you're probably very tired, so you, you, you don't need warming up, uh, but I'd like to do this activity anyway. Don't worry, you can sit where you are. You don't have to move around. You don't even have to uh, respond if you don't wish to. But I'd like to do um, a, a three, two, one activity on, on communicative writing. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, a little activity. It can be used as a warmer. It can be used to close a lesson. You can use it in the middle of a lesson. Um, it can be used to get students to predict things. It can get be used to get students to review things. There are many different ways that you can use it. What we're going to use it for now at the start um, is to find out what you already know. So the three means three things, three items, three points. And I want you to think, please don't write anything, not yet, but to think for about 45 seconds, three things that you already know about communicative writing. What does it mean to you? Please don't write anything, just, just think 45 seconds or so. What does it mean to you? Few more seconds. Okay, throw things in the chat box. Type anything that you like. Three things about communicative writing. Some people have jumped the gun. Uh, use of rhetorical questions. Nice. Yeah, figurative language. <coughs> Doaz says organizing, organization skills. Very important uh, in communicative writing. Yeah, anything else that comes to mind? 
a conversation that's interesting for Mona yeah a writing piece that includes conversation uh, Fatima says it needs to be emotive it needs to um, raise people's emotions um, uh, Namin mentions communicating through writing emails and messages reports and reviews I like that one for them from Namin thank you very much exchanging ideas raising awareness direct and open questions loads and loads of ideas coming in now um, people asking about certificates I refuse to respond to those questions <laughs> interaction writing about real life situations okay we're well, obviously going to come back to these points that you're making um, during our during our session uh, today the two refers to two challenges so what are the challenges that you face in the classroom when teaching communicative writing 30 seconds think please don't write anything stop the chat stop the chat no more writing in the chat box think for 30 seconds two challenges that you face you'll have a chance to write in just a minute don't write in the chat box not yet don't write. Stop writing. Stop. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds. Now you can write. Now you can write in the chat box. It's wonderful that you're so um, engaged and that you want to um, start writing immediately. Okay, weaknesses in, in, in standard English. Okay, inability to express. Uh, creative thinking. I guess, Shaveta, you mean lack of creative thinking. Vocabulary, spelling different um, uh, demographies. What, Naveed, what exactly do you mean by that? Maybe you can explain a little bit more. Uh, clarity and effectiveness, the format um, of communicative writing. Yeah, that's, that's a good one, isn't it? Uh, lack of ideas, yeah. Time, authenticity, students don't develop the ideas. Um, Saido's talking about ESL students to put their ideas into writing. Yeah, making that cognitive transfer, yeah. Not enough vocabulary, that's come up quite a few times, hasn't it? Structure, grammar, structure, grammar, vocabulary, grammar, spelling, grammar, 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 grammar. Okay, stop, no more grammar. And that there's actually 40 more messages, which I'm not going to, I'm not going to look at, but I think you get the idea um, that we do face challenges. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, uh, you'll have a few ideas about how to deal with <coughs> these challenges. And finally, uh, the one thing I want you to do, and again, 30, uh, second, 30 seconds, and please don't write these in the chat box. What you can do is put them into the Q&A box, which is a different function in Zoom. Uh, so next to the chat icon, you've got the Q&A uh, icon. So we're not going to uh, see your questions now, but put them into the Q&A. So number, the, the final, the three, two, one, is one question that you have about communicative writing. So again, 30 seconds. Please don't type in the chat box, but put them in the Q&A if you have a real burning question. Uh, about communicative writing and maybe maybe um, we'll be able to answer that at the end of this session okay Brilliant. There's not much has gone into the Q&A, which is great. So <laughs> we're not going to be overloaded with questions <clears throat> in the, in the Q&A at the end. Okay, on the screen, um, I've put some images for you. I'd just like you to, to look at the images and have a think about um, uh, what, they, what they represent in terms of uh, written English. Um, hopefully you can see them as examples of, um, let's call it uh, real world English. The type of English that we use uh, in the real world. Of course, uh, you know we're, we're talking about English because we're English language teachers. But it could be Arabic, it it, it, it could be Japanese, it could be Spanish, it could be uh, Portuguese, it, it could be any language. It, it's still the same. For written language to be um, real world, it needs to exist uh, in the real world as text. So over on the left hand side, top top left hand side of your screen. Um, what, what's, the, what's the real world writing that's going on there? Just quickly throw it in the chat box. Some doing messaging. Yeah, and everybody does it every day, even, even young, young people. Obviously not very young kids, but you know, pretty much everybody um, is, is using it. 
Uh, and I wonder, you don't need to answer this question, it's a rhetorical question, but how many of us allow students to do that type of real world writing in the classroom? Do we let students write things uh, on their phones in the classroom and even you know, send them to each other or our, or our phones banned? Or do we feel that students will abuse them? As I say, you don't need to answer that question, but um, you know, do, do certainly think about it and ask yourselves, maybe I could use mobile phones in the classroom, as long as it's controlled uh, you know, for a certain amount of time, no reason why you couldn't do it. Next one um, is obviously a, a shopping list. Do people still make shopping, write shopping lists? Certainly when I'm at home on the fridge, uh, there's a piece of paper up there with a magnet and you know, myself and my family, we write things up there. So that, that's, a, that, that's a very, very good example of, of real world writing, which still exists today, despite technology. I think most people probably still have a, a message board or somewhere where they write things which they need to uh, get when they go shopping. This one over on the top right with the red uh, pencil, what, what's that? <coughs> Just throw something in the chat box. What type of real world is that? Sarah says that she uses uh, shopping lists. Good, I'm glad I'm not the only one, Sarah. Uh, Simon mentions uh, uh, note making in the top right. Yeah, Ivy says notes and Tonita says notes, 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 lecture notes, yeah, obviously. Um, this is an example of, of note taking. Maybe note taking we do do in the classroom. Uh, we ask students to listen and make notes or we say to them, make notes as you read something. So probably that type of real world English uh, does creep in uh, to the language classroom. Uh, bottom left, what have we got there? Very obviously, put it in the chat. An email says, uh, Saima, yeah, loads of people writing email. Um, interestingly, we, we may ask um, our students to write an email, but not like this. We ask them to, to do it with a pencil or a pen uh, in the classroom. Not everybody, of course. I'm, I'm sure you know, some of you allow uh, students to write things um, uh, digitally in, in, in the classroom if you have the technology. Uh, but, but maybe a lot of, you know, write an email to a friend. It's even an exam question, isn't it? Write an email to your friend. Here's a pencil. Write it on paper. So it's not, it's not really an email, is it? Um, and then finally, bottom right, what type of writing is that? Bottom right. <coughs> yeah, articles. Uh, it is news fonts, but I think the idea we're trying to get here is it's journalism, it's newspapers, um, it's magazines. So writing, um, the, the real world writing here is writing an article, uh, for example. And again, that's, that's, that's an exam question. It comes up in the IGCSE exam, write an article, write a report. Um, and we all panic because we don't really know what that means or, or how to actually prepare students uh, to do it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that um, written English in the real world exists and it exists as, as real text. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it, it all exists in, in all languages. So it's not, this is not just about learning English. Students will see this and know this uh, in their own first language. And all of this writing makes sense because it has a context. And if something has a context, um, it, it also therefore has, has a purpose. And we'll come back to those um, issues in just a moment. So I've, I've, I've mentioned uh, a couple of times already the type of writing that, uh, that our students do, uh, but just, just give yourselves <coughs> 30 seconds or so to think about it. Um, think about what kinds of texts texts your students write. Don't write anything yet, just give yourselves 30 seconds thinking time. If you had a class today, did you ask your students to write anything? What, what, what did they write? Just think. Or a class yesterday, or you know, you're planning a class for tomorrow, what, what, what are your students actually going to write? Okay, already we've got uh, people writing in the chat box, articles, report writing, make an attractive ad or a slogan. Very nice example from Ahmed Hassan uh, of, of real world writing, communicative writing. Khalid says, I allow students to use chat language. Brilliant. Well done, Khalid. <coughs> I haven't got time to read everything that you've said, but um, everybody else, please have a look. Informal emails, letters, environment issues. Uh, SP, that's, that's really more of a topic, isn't it, than uh, a type of writing. Paragraphs and essays, descriptive essays, games, summaries. Yeah, okay, loads and loads of stuff coming in. Yeah, uh, some of it, some of the examples you're giving, I would uh, categorize as um, real world English. 
Um, others are not. That doesn't mean they're not right. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. It doesn't mean that they're bad, but they're just not examples of the type of writing which we would see uh, in the real world. Of course, giving students the opportunity to do other types of writing does still help them to practice and develop their writing skills. So when they come to do real world writing, uh, they are going to be better prepared. But another question I have for you now um, is this. Who reads the texts that your students write uh, in English? And again, just give yourselves a little bit of time, 10, 15 seconds thinking time. Don't write anything. Hold back. Heba, hold back. Stop, stop. <laughs> Okay, now right. Now you can put it in the chat box. Goodness me. Okay, peer groups, teacher, teacher, peer groups, teacher, students, teacher, peer groups, teacher, peer groups. Target reader. Ah, Medina. Yes, you're avoiding the <laughs> avoiding the question. Students themselves, me as a teacher, peers, teacher. Peer. I mean, basically, in a classroom situation, the people who are going to read the text that students write, obviously themselves. Sometimes they're peers, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the teacher that reads them. But in the real world, of course, um, uh, real world writing, communicative writing um, is, is, is read and digested uh, by, by many, many different types um, of, uh, of reader, diff different types of uh, audience. So classroom writing very often reflects examinations. It reflects the type of things that students need to do in, in, in an examination. Um, if you think about the IGCSE, English as a Second Language exam, um, the first <coughs> extended writing is an email to a friend, an email to a family member. So it's a very informal type of uh, writing. So of course, we, we, we gear our, uh, our teaching and we gear the type of writing that we want students to do towards that particular uh, writing genre, uh, if you like. And then the second extended uh, piece of writing is more formal, report, article, whatever it is. Um, so students are being assessed on their ability to produce different types um, of writing. And therefore, we do, of course, um, as I say, gear our writing uh, or, or our teaching of writing uh, so that students are well prepared uh, in those particular types. And it, it may be that other types of writing are actually forgotten, which is a great shame, isn't it? Because you know whether or not they do well in, in, in their examination, they're still going to go, you know, live beyond the exam and go out into the real world, and they do need to have that ability um, to communicate in, in the real world. So let's have a look a bit, look, little. Let's have a look at some of the theory which underpins um, communicative writing, and uh, the quote I want to show you. Um, is from the uh, Cambridge Life Competencies uh, Framework, <coughs> which you may or may not be familiar with. If you're not, um, just go online, Google Cambridge Life Competencies Framework, and you'll find everything you need to know about it. Unfortunately, we don't have time today uh, to talk about it, but uh, you'll find it a, a load of really interesting information, activities, ideas, so on and so forth. So in the Cambridge Life Competencies Framework, when we're talking about uh, communication as, as one of the competencies, we say that in this, in this connected world, you know, digitally connected, technically connected, communication is an essential skill. And it's essential because it, it provides us with this, uh, with the resources, with the abilities to get our ideas and our opinions, feelings across to other people in, in a meaningful rather than a mechanical way. So we're actually communicating in, in a useful real world manner. Of course, uh, communication also allows us to access information like you're doing now. Uh, you're communicating with me. I know it's only through the chat box, but we're still communicating. Uh, you're accessing information through attending this webinar today, through what's on the screen, through listening to me, through reading uh, what your colleagues and your, and your peers are talking about. Um, it provides opportunities and of course um, it allows us to build up and to develop uh, relationships. So we know that communication is important. <coughs> Heber mentions in the chat box that interaction um, is also, it, you know, it, it's important. We, we have a type of interaction going on now. Um, you know, much of the communication in the last two years has had to be like this uh, through Zoom because of the pandemic. 
Um, I know we're slowly, slowly going back to uh, in-person communication, um, but you know, there, there's still going to be a place for this type of communication. We wouldn't be able to have all of you people together here now if it wasn't um, for, for online um, technology. So following on from this, you know, still with that question in mind, why is written communication in, in, um, important? Um, a written communication is important because it provides students with opportunities to use the language which we're teaching them in the classroom. So rather than doing mechanical activities, rote learning types of activities, which really don't provide students with any strong foundation for communicative writing, for real world writing, <coughs> Written communication um, needs to be reused. It needs to be uh, interconnected. Um, students need to bring together everything that they've studied, their own knowledge, um, because if, if we don't do that, then they're never actually going to have the uh, ability. And this is from um, a quite a recent uh, handbook for teachers, uh, uh, a Cambridge paper by Philip Kerr. Um, how much time should we give uh, to speaking practice? And Philip Kerr makes the point um, that communication, it, it, it's always about doing something. Um, think of what we ask students to do in the classroom. Is, is everything that we ask them to do in the classroom, uh, is it purposeful? Does it, does it really have a purpose? Or are we just asking them to do something for the sake of it? Um, and, I, and I'm not being critical of anybody or, or negative, but just, you know, it's a fact of life, I think, that some of the things that we ask our students to do uh, may not be particularly uh, uh, purposeful. And therefore, uh, when we, if, if we think about what using English really means, um, or any language for that matter, um, we're using the language in order to achieve something. We're using the language in order uh, to do something. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's have a think about um, how we can promote communicative writing uh, in the classroom. <coughs> I've got five ideas for you. I want you to have a look at these five ideas um, and I've blanked out some of the words. Um, see if you can tell me uh, what the blanked out words are. I wish you could tell me, but you can't. Um, so you have to write it in the chat box. Um, so here's the, here's the first one. Oh, they're all coming up together. Never mind. Elicit and clarify elements of the what? And you can see the first letter and you can see the last letter. <coughs> yeah, uh, we've got oh, we've got two answers actually coming up. We've got content and we've got context coming up. Let's just do the first one. Don't go on to the next one, please. Yeah, we've got both context and content. So what we need to do if we want to promote communicative writing, we do need to um, elicit and clarify elements of the context, the situation, if you like, the holistic uh, within which uh, the writing is actually going to take place. Of course, if you wrote um, content, then that follows on from the context, doesn't it? But without the context, you can't know what the content is going to be. So context needs uh, to come first. Secondly, we need to give students a what to read and follow. Lots of people writing model, 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 model. Some people are saying mode, but I think mode is, is, is fine. Uh, mode is a, is a path, isn't it? It's a method. Okay, we've, we've, got, we've got that one. So, but what does it actually mean? Well, a, a model, if you like, is a, is a, a, a written picture, um, if you like, of what we want students uh, to actually produce very important that we provide models uh, for students. Otherwise, how on earth do they know what they're supposed to produce at the end? It doesn't matter how much, how much you tell them uh, about what you want them to produce, they need to see a model of it. Um, and, and, and any good uh, lesson on writing will provide students with a model so they can see what it is that they're actually supposed to produce at the end. And, and the model should provide students with guidance on the length, the formality level, should it be more formal or, or should it be more informal? Um, 
the, um, uh, the type of vocabulary that should be used, the type of structure that should be used, and so on and so forth. So uh, modeling to students in the way that we, we model the present perfect tense, in the model that we, in the way that we model the, the different sounds of per and b, uh, which exist in, in, um, in our alphabet. Um, uh, we, we're doing this so that students can, can get a grasp on what they actually need uh, to produce. The third bullet, set tasks that give students an what? A name, an article, an application, an audience, an analysis, an application, <laughs> an apple, <laughs> an answer, an avenue. Well, I think all we're doing now is having words beginning with A, <laughs> which is great. Okay, let's, let's see what, what I had in mind set tasks that give students an audience. They need to know who they're writing for. Um, and of course, you know, we, we just talked about who's going to read it. <coughs> and we said that usually it's just the teacher, but students don't, shouldn't be thinking that the audience is the teacher. Um, there should be a, a designated um, audience, you know, write to a friend, write to the prime minister, you know, write, write to a newspaper, whatever it might be, but not write to the teacher, even though we know that it is the teacher that's ultimately going to be reading it. But without the audience, again, it's very difficult for students to um, know exactly what content uh, should be and the uh, formality level. Okay, the fourth bullet, provide support with useful P or V. P or V, we've got phrases and vocabularies, useful phrases or vocabulary, phrases, vocabulary, prompts, Nice word there from Ivy, phrases, vocabulary. Yeah, there's lots of, lots of votes, I think, for, pre, for purpose and vocabulary. What else have we got? Phrases, vocabulary, phrases, <coughs> excuse me, phrases, vocabulary. Let's see, what did I have in mind? Phrases, vocabulary, yeah. And of course that will appear in the model, but we need to highlight uh, the particular phrases and vocabulary that we would like students uh, to repeat. In other words, going back to what Philip Kerr said, we need to provide students with opportunities to actually use uh, the language which we've been teaching, because if we give them an opportunity to use the language, then of course, um, it all becomes much, much more uh, purposeful. And then the last one, give students some ideas of what to write. Now think back to the three to one activity at the beginning. Um, the last one was uh, one, uh, sorry, uh, two challenges that you have. Uh, and quite a few of you were saying, students don't come up with ideas. This is not an examination, it's not a test. If they haven't got any ideas, give them some ideas. Give them some little uh, points that they can do. The examination does it. It gives them little pictures um, with uh, speech bubbles. And you know, I, I think that we should build um, uh, uh, an adventure playground. I think we should use the money to help people uh, in this part of the world. You know, that, that support is there. Um, so we're giving students ideas. Um, which, which we hope they'll be able to take on board and actually use <coughs> in the writing that they're going to be doing. So <coughs> there's basically five things that we need to take out of uh, what's on the screen at the moment. In other words, what promotes communicative writing. First of all, um, we've talked about providing students with a context. Then we've talked about uh, providing students with a model. We've talked about audience, we've talked about phrases and vocabulary, and we've talked about giving students ideas. So here's an example from uh, my IGCSE English as a Second Language course book, um, the, um, uh, the new sixth edition. Um, we know that the final uh, question in the exam is, is, is a formal piece of writing, uh, it could be an essay. Um, so in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the new edition, uh, we're explaining um, what an essay is so the students understand uh, what an essay is it requires what the students need to include um, so this talks about the audience um, it says that it's a specific type uh, of article promoting an argument <coughs> it talks about the type of ideas that could go in the type of opinions that could go on where an essay might appear in a newspaper etc etc so it's providing students with information um, about a particular context that's then followed up with a model. So students are provided uh, with uh, a model text. You can see uh, this is about um, 
uh, youth organizations um, broken down into four different paragraphs again this appears in the in the new book so we've we've provided students um, with a clear understanding of what the context is and now the second thing that we've done um, is to provide them with uh, a model text um, you don't have to provide the model text um, in the right order. You could jumble it up. You could do it as a jigsaw reading. So they have to think a bit more deeply about it, put it back into the right order. You could gap uh, the model text, leave words out. So it becomes a sort of a, um, a guided writing uh, activity uh, based around a model text. Lots and lots of different things that, that you can do with it. But um, let's not forget, it's very, very important that we provide students with uh, a model text. We also, of course, uh, need to provide students with um, more information about uh, what they're going to be doing. They need to know what the audience is. So in this um, example from the book, um, you'll see that it says here in the middle, now write an essay for the school magazine. <coughs> so students will understand uh, immediately who's going to be reading um, uh, whatever it is that they write their essay. Uh, in this particular point. And as I was just mentioning in the examination, um, students are actually provided uh, with some uh, ideas and um, uh, that they can actually use uh, in, their, in their writing. So we've got two examples here, two speech bubbles. Uh, usually the speech bubbles are opposites, taking you know, different sides uh, of an argument. So we've, had, we've got context, we've got the model text, we've got the audience, we've got phrases and vocabulary. And of course, uh, what we also need um, is um, ideas, um, more information. So we've got a, a writing tip over here and over on the right hand side, um, we've got another writing uh, tip which talks about audience. It, it, it says that it affects the words and expressions. So more support for students so they understand uh, more about the ideas uh, that they need. If you look at the two different structures here, we're, we're offering two different ways that students could approach their writing. Um, how they can um, how they can balance it. Um, so this is all about um, ideas and about uh, structure. I think if if we provide students with these five things: the context, the model, an audience, um, some language input, phrases and vocabulary, and um, of course ideas that they can they can write about, um, uh, students are much more likely to be able to produce uh, the type of text uh, that, that that we want. Remember. The exam takes place, you know, either in the, the winter session, sorry, the um, uh, November session or in the uh, May, June session. Um, but all of the time before that is, is not about testing. It should be about teaching, uh, supporting students, helping them to develop the skills that they need so they can do well in the actual examination. OK, so um, I think we've we've had a look at what communicative writing actually involves, what it requires, what the essentials are. Um, let's have a think now about um, <coughs> differentiation and uh, uh, the key principles of, of, uh, of differentiated learning, uh, because, you know, despite what I've just been saying about uh, writing and communicative writing, uh, writing uh, I know that every classroom uh, you have mixed ability and not all students support. Um, what uh, the, the key principles are of, of, of differentiated learning. So um, you may have come across uh, somebody called Carol Tomlinson. Um, Carol Tomlinson is, uh, is really one of the, um, or not one of, possibly the uh, uh, key figures in, um, uh, in, in differentiation working at the University of Virginia in the States. Um, she's written an enormous amount of very, very impressive and interesting um, material around differentiated learning um, and one of the things that she mentions which I thought was quite relevant um, to what we're talking about today is this so I'll just leave you to read that And interestingly, the third word that she uses is simply, you know, differentiation is no big deal, actually. <coughs> Concept, at least, anyway. So differentiation is actually uh, about seeing people as individuals uh, and not seeing them um, as all being 
part of one big uh, machine in the uh, in, in, in the classroom. So this leads us to consider uh, a differentiated learning mindset, if you like, or, or, or a philosophy. What, what should we be what should we be thinking of if we're going to um, implement uh, differentiated learning in the classroom? So once again, I've, I'm going to give five uh, mindset ideas and I'd like you to uh, tell me what the missing words are. These are a bit more difficult, I think, than the one you just did. Um, so now there's, there's a challenge for you. You need to show me that, that um, um, it, 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 it's not more difficult. Just very quickly, uh, Heber says you need to focus on certain students. Um, uh, yes, you will be focusing on certain students, but you'll also be focusing on all students. Um, so differentiation is not just about students who need support, but differentiation is also about students who need to be challenged. Um, I think we do tend to think of it's only the weak ones who need help. But no, it's not. It's also the stronger students who need to be who need to be stretched uh, so that they can uh, reach their potential. OK, so first one. You see the class as a collection of what? Begins with I. Put it in the chat box. Individuals, 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 individuals. Yes, yes. So the differentiated learning classroom um, is, is seeing people as a collection of individuals and not just seeing them as class three or class you know, pre-IGCSE or, or whatever it might be. They all need to be seen um, as uh, individuals. It doesn't mean that we, we need to teach all of them all the time as individuals, but we do need to recognize uh, that they are all uh, different which leads nicely into the uh, second one, because each student, each individual, um, each one has their own unique, lots of people are saying experience in each lesson. Let's have a look. Yes, every student will um, get something different out of a lesson um, in the same way that uh, all of you joining us today, you're all getting something different out of uh, what we're doing today. Of course, when there's nearly 200 people, uh, it's a bit more difficult to see you as a collection of individuals than it might be in a classroom uh, with 20, 30 or 40 students. But I, I think you understand uh, the point we're trying to make here. OK, the third bullet, you what to learning about each student. Their something and something. Uh, Shaveta says you continue, Navid, control, check, cater, care contribute, cater, commit from Simon. Yes, I think Simon's got it. Let's have a look. Yes, you commit to learning about each other, about each student. In other words, you don't say, I can't be bothered, or it's there's too many, or I haven't got time. But um, the differentiated learning mindset means that we do commit ourselves to learning about each um, uh, student, their characteristics, their personalities, and their interests, because of course, not all students are interested uh, in, the same, in the same things. And we need to recognize that and, and, and exploit it um, as, as, as much as we can. And finally, you what? React, respond, yeah, I put respond, but it could be react, to the differences that you notice in your what? Practice. <laughs> and in your teaching, so maybe not practice, another word, planning, yeah, in your planning and in your teaching. So if you want to um, implement differentiated learning successfully in the classroom, you do need to have uh, this particular mindset. So Carol, Carol Ann Tomlinson um, has um, coined, if you like, six differentiated learning uh, principles. So I'm going to first of all show you these six principles. Then I'm going to give you a description of each of the six principles, but you need to guess which description matches which principle. So I'm not going to say anything about the six principles to begin with. It's going to be up to you to decide what each of them means and to match them uh, with the correct uh, description. So here's the first one. Respectful tasks. Now, if you're thinking, what on earth does that mean? Don't worry, you're going to get a description in a minute, but just, just be thinking about it. That differentiated learning, one of the principles of differentiated learning is that the tasks we give students are 
respectful. So you should be asking yourself, respectful in what way? That's the first one. Second one, quality curriculum. Quality curriculum. A second principle of differentiated learning. Now, when you see the third one, you'll be thinking, ah, okay. So I think the third one is a bit more um, uh, common uh, when we talk about differentiated uh, learning. So you, you won't be surprised by this one. Flexible grouping. Flexible grouping. So I'm not, I'm not going to say too much now. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more when we, when we see the descriptors. The fourth one. <coughs> Continual assessment. The idea of formative assessment. And the next one, teaching up. Sixth one, building community. So, these are our six differentiated learning principles. I'm now going to put a description uh, one by one of the six on the screen, obviously not in the same order as they're currently on the screen. And I'm also going to show you, <coughs> excuse me, an example from Cambridge IGCSE English as a Second Language uh, course book. So you can see how the principles um, uh, are reflected in the in the course material. Okay, so here's the first one. So what I'd like you to do is to read the description and please, please, please do not write anything in the chat box, not until I tell you. So you can be ready, but don't press send. So you need to think, actually what you might want to do is very quickly take a, a screenshot with your phone of those six principles or make a written note if you've got a, a pencil and paper handy just so you remember what the six principles are. Yeah. So here's the first one. Which of the six is this? But please don't put anything in the chat box yet. Is anybody? No. Oh, okay, right. So here's the first one. So we've got a description and underneath it, an example um, of how it appears in the course book. Don't write anything yet. I'll tell you when to write. Okay. Send. I see the right answer, but I'm not going to tell you which one it is. We've got, I think we've got all six. <coughs> yeah, we've got all six, but I think one is coming through slightly more than the others. This is the idea of, of challenge. This is the idea of teaching up. Yeah, I mentioned earlier that differentiation is not just about supporting students who are, who are struggling uh, or maybe, maybe being left behind, but it's also about uh, challenging students as well, um, even challenging students who you think can't be challenged, but all students need to be challenged. They need to be made to think. Um, so don't don't disregard students who who you feel are you know in the bottom third uh, of of the classroom. Challenge them, but maybe challenge them in a different way from the way that you're challenging uh, other students. Okay, so that's the first one. Here's the second one. Again, please do not write in the chat box. Uh, until I tell you to. So here's the second one. Okay, three, two, one, send. 
Wow. <laughs> it's moving like a rocket. <clears throat> Again, we've got a little bit of uh, disagreement, but I think the one I'm seeing most is building community, building community. So the classroom should be a place where children learn to respect and value the differences of others and where everybody feels that they belong, this idea of a, a community. And we, the teachers, um, we can do one of two things. We can either support it through uh, differentiated learning or we can ignore it. And if we ignore it, then of course, we're undermining uh, the whole thing. Okay, next one. The third differentiated learning principle. Don't write anything, hold off. I'll tell you when to send. Okay, send. Okay, lots of people writing the answer which I've got, which is respectful tasks. So well done, everybody. So students should work with tasks that are equally interesting and engaging. I guess the two are linked, really. If something's interesting, then it's also going to be engaging for students. <coughs> Whichever group they're actually working in. We want the task to promote understanding and application uh, of the target content and require students to think. Okay. And our fourth one. I think you can do this straight away, just send, because this is probably the, the easiest one of, of the six. Yeah, Simon says groupings, groupings, group. Yeah, okay, of course, this one is all about uh, using flexible groupings. Um, changing the groupings. Um, all students are going to be different in, in how ready they are uh, to learn for, for various reasons, but of course they're also going to be uh, different in terms of their um, their interests and how much energy they've got, etc, etc, etc. And that's why it's always important to be changing uh, groups around. Don't allow students to always be in the same group with the same students. There's no reason why they can't have a home group. You can send them off to different groups and then they come back to their home group if they want to be with their best friends. You know, if they give you a hard time about uh, not being with their friends, you know, go to that group for 10 minutes and then you can come back uh, and be with your friends, but keep things moving, keep things changing around. Okay, number five, you've only got two left, so it should be getting easier to do this. So I'm gonna allow you just to quickly type straight into the chat box. No need to think, you've got two left. What's this one? Yeah, this is all about the quality uh, curriculum, obviously. Um, so this planned uh, plans of lessons, sequences of lessons, um, which we want to uh, engage students with the content that they actually need so that they can be successful uh, in whatever it is that we're asking them to do. And therefore, of course, you don't need to type the last one. <coughs> the last one must be continual assessment. So our expectation should be that our students are going to, uh, are going to grow, they're going to change. Uh, so they need to be continually uh, learning more things, collecting, a, a, a gathering information. Uh, teachers need to be doing this so that they understand more about what students need, so things don't get boring in the classroom, so that we can adapt things and change them uh, based, on, based on our students. Okay, so um, we've looked at community writing essentials, we've looked at the principles of differentiated learning, so let's have a little think now about uh, practical differentiation. And a question I'd like to <coughs> throw to you is, in what ways do your learners uh, differ from each other? And I think there are three key elements that we need to consider here. <coughs> I do apologize for my bad throat. I think the first thing we need to consider is that students differ from each other in terms of their readiness uh, to do something. And there are many elements within uh, readiness. It could be based on their, their abilities, um, but it could be, uh, could be based on other factors as well. Students also differ, of course, in, um, in, in terms of their interest. 
some are interested in this and some are interested in that and some are interested in that and we need to take all of this into consideration and the third thing of course um, in, in uh, third way in which learners differ is of course in their profile uh, their learning profile the ways the way or the ways in which uh, they um, uh, they prefer to learn. Do they like to take notes? Do they like to record? Do they like to learn through reading? Do they like to learn through listening? And you know all all of the different elements uh, of, of a learning profile. So it's really important as teachers that we understand <coughs> that our learners uh, differ from each other. Because if we understand how learners uh, are different, then of course that will impact um, on what we do in the language classroom. So the second question is in what ways do tasks differ from each other? So we also need to consider um, the tasks that are in the course books uh, and how tasks differ from each other and what we can do uh, to a task in order to make it different from another task. And of course, you're probably familiar with the three elements, the three ways in which tasks differ from each other. Um, they can differ in the, um, in, in the content, uh, they can differ in the process, what we what we do with them and of course they can differ in the product or the outcome so the content is what we give the students the input the reading text the listening text the picture the video whatever it might be the process is what they do with it and the product um, is what comes out at the end um, of course um, student course books um, nowadays thank goodness provide or, or the teachers resources at least provide lots of opportunities uh, for teachers to differentiate. Um, I'll show you some examples in, in, in just a moment. But even without a teacher's book, we, we, we as teachers need to be looking at what's in the course book and thinking about how we can differentiate it. Obviously, content is quite difficult to differentiate because it's there, it's been carefully chosen, it's been carefully written, it includes the target vocabulary or it's the right genre. So it's actually very, very difficult um, to, to change uh, or uh, the content but of course what we can do is think more about the process uh, and the product so on your screens now you can see a, a, a template if you like um, which will give us some ideas about how we can in, in a more practical sense how we can differentiate uh, things in the classroom so coming up on your screen now um, if we give students the opportunity to work alone or work with a partner do we ever do that that's a rhetorical question don't need to answer but I, I suspect that we don't very often give students that that choice we probably say everybody work with your partner or everybody work on your own or everybody work in groups but maybe sometimes you could use the instruction if you'd like to work with your partner, that's absolutely fine. But if you want to work on your own, that's also absolutely fine. I'm not suggesting that the, everyone who's here doesn't do this, but I'm just saying I suspect that generally speaking, we don't do this. At least we don't do it uh, very often. So where does that come on our, on our template, on our grid? Um, it probably comes over here uh, in terms of learning profile and uh, process. And just as an example, um, here's an example, um, work in pairs A, B, um, and they're having to alternate uh, suggestions, two of you do this and two of you do that and so on and so forth. So the, the students are not constantly doing the same thing. The whole class um, is, is not doing the same thing. Second one, pre-teaching vocabulary for some <coughs> groups. Now, again, you know, uh, it's great if you're doing this, but I suspect that not everybody uh, does it uh, very often. Um, pre-teaching vocabulary again we tend to pre-teach vocabulary for the whole class because we just assume that everybody needs it but maybe some don't maybe some need it more than others so this idea of pre-teaching vocabulary for particular groups of students um, is, is, a, is an example a practical example of differentiation in the classroom and it's an example of course of uh, differentiating the content uh, in, a, in, a, in a classroom activity and here's just an example from the IGCSE course book, working groups of three, each group member should choose four of the 12 words. So this is not exactly pre-teaching vocab for some groups, but it means that different groups are actually working on different vocabulary based on their understanding. So rather than assuming that everybody needs all of them, we're actually allowing students uh, to choose the, the words and the phrases 
uh, that, they, that they're uncomfortable with. Uh, a third one, students work in groups according to their interests. So this is um, uh, an example of uh, interest and um, uh, process. And the example from the book, work in the same pairs. Student A reads, about, reads the text about um, ginger. Student B reads the text uh, about honey. Now, the next thing I'm gonna show you is putting all of that together. Um, you might wanna take a very quick screenshot of that because we won't be able to give it to you as a document, but it's really a breakdown of how teachers can differentiate content process and product and a student's readiness, interest, and learning profile. So just take a quick, quick shot of that. I'm very aware of the time, so I'm uh, to the end. We're nearly done. We'll have a few minutes for Q and A. Of course, you can you'll receive a, a link to a recording of the webinar later on, and you'll be able to see this uh, in in the recording later on. So this template allows us to think about ways in which we can differentiate not only different, sorry, differentiate not only um, content process and product, but thinking about our learners' readiness and their interests and their learning uh, profile as well. So we've uh, we've looked at uh, the essentials, we've looked at the principles of differentiation, and we've just had a quick look at uh, some examples of practical. Uh, differentiation, which means uh, it's time for some conclusions. <coughs> so three, three points that I want to make, uh, really three takeaways I think that you need um, from this. The first of all is that um, writing needs to be um, uh, contextualized. Um, and by contextualizing writing, um, that's going to lead um, to communication, a much better type of uh, communication it will be the the, the, the foreground if you like uh, to communication remember that differentiation is is not a technique as such there are many techniques within the whole concept of um, uh, differentiation so we need to think of differentiation more as a more as a, a philosophy uh, of teaching rather than lots and lots of different things uh, that we can do because if you have that philosophy in mind then um, uh, the, the the elements of it I think will come across more more naturally and I think another very important uh, point about all of this is that we need to match learners to tasks where possible I know it's difficult I know that we're challenged in the classroom I know that many of us have, are teaching very very large numbers but uh, I do think we need to start moving away from this idea that every student needs to do everything in the course but they don't um, time is actually wasted because we insist that every student does everything in the classroom. So this idea of matching learners uh, to different tasks um, is, is something that we really need to take on board. If you think about a typical reading text and there are several activities that go with it, you know, why not give one, uh, one exercise to one group of students and another exercise to another group of students? Then they can share, um, you know, the, 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 the solutions and the answers that they come up with. So at the beginning we had three, two, one. So I just want to very quickly uh, return to it. You don't need to write in the chat box because we're out of time and it will take forever. Um, but I'd like you now to think about uh, three things that you've learned today about uh, communicative writing. As I say, please don't write in the chat box because um, it will go crazy. Two activities you want to try when teaching communicative writing. And one question that you still have about communicative writing, if you're very quick, you can put it in the Q&A box and you might get lucky and we might be able to answer it uh, in the next five minutes. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and George is here and we've got a little bit of time to do some Q&A. Thank you, Peter, for that absolutely excellent presentation. I can see in the chat that everyone found it so helpful and useful, so that's really great to see. Uh, we have run over, so we don't have a lot of time left, but I'll try and get one or two questions in. Um, firstly, I'm going to go to Anna, who asks if you have any tips to assess students' writing production. Tips. I think the... Um... I think the key with uh, assessment of writing, the first thing I would say is don't always assess it. Um, I think, um, you know, remove, remove that element of fear 
uh, from students. Not all writing needs to be assessed. Remember, as I said earlier, uh, the test is not until November or May. Uh, and the periods leading up to that needs to be about helping students to develop. Of course, yes, you do need to do exam practice, but my big tip would be don't always assess writing, don't grade it, give feedback, but don't necessarily provide a grade. Give students opportunities to redraft and do things uh, in, 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 in different ways. So that, that's what I would say, first of all. Thank you, Peter. And next we have a question from Naveed. And they ask, how can we improve vocabulary of students when we have students from different parts of the world? Um, some may have better English than others. Um, well, of course, that's an issue of uh, mixed ability. And it goes back to what we've been saying about differentiation. Um, I think the only way that students are going to improve their vocabulary links back to what we said at the beginning, what Philip Kerr said, it gets students to use vocabulary. Um, you know, just giving students, you know, lists of words or um, asking students to learn words, you know, it, it just doesn't work. Students need to be given situations, contexts, tasks where they can actually use uh, vocabulary in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. If students are using a vocabulary and, of course, grammar structures in meaningful ways, then, then they will retain it. It will stick. But it's when students don't get those opportunities that I think um, a lot of the vocabulary teaching, you know, just goes in one ear and out the other because there's, there's nothing to stop it. And, and giving them a task to do something based on the vocabulary will, will help them to retain it. 